So this is a, an open chain webinar, uh, one of a very long series we've been running, covering topics around open source management. We mostly stay in the area of legal activities, but we essentially cover anything that involves a company looking at open source and thinking, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with the governance of this? How do I deal with risk management? How do I deal with just putting this into my strategy? Where does this fit in the portfolio? And today we're covering a topic that is very close to the heart of a lot of people involved in business management of open source, um, understanding essentially how things like AI will impact your workflows around code. What does that mean for you? What does it mean in general? And we're very lucky to have Greg and Gian from GitHub to talk about GitHub Copilot, which was definitely the first thing that came to mind um, as we started considering the management of code and AI. Um, I think every company in our ecosystem who has talked to me about um, open source code and then AI has brought up that their engineering departments are looking at GitHub Copilot, are using GitHub Copilot, or asking to use GitHub Copilot. Now, AI is one of those topics, like cloud in the early days, where the phrase is available, what it means is less clear. So that's why we've gone straight to the source. Instead of having uh, third parties talk about uh, this particular domain, we're going to go right to the root and ask, what's up with this stuff? What does it mean? How, how is it managed? How do we frame this, particularly from the legal and business side? Now, before we kick off, I'll just show the Linux Foundation antitrust policy notice. Um, and this is something we show at the beginning of every meeting. You'll find the full antitrust policy on the Linux Foundation website. And if you're from a member company, you can ask questions of our counsel, Andy Updegrove. Um, that out of the way, what we'll do is we'll just jump straight into our presentation so we give our presenters room to breathe, a chance to talk. Um, the open chain webinars generally are totally informal in that people can raise a question at any time. Uh, they can, you know, send something in the chat if they want to. Um, and I'll just, you know, it's up to you, uh, Greg and on how you want to run this, but um, if it's okay with you, we'll keep the same basic structure that people might raise questions as we go, as it hits on something that's on their mind. And apart from that, uh, please regard this as us sitting down at a table and some knowledgeable people helping us out. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. I am T. Greg Doucette here with GitHub's commercial legal team. I'm joined by Jian Yoon, who is our head of commercial legal. And we are here to talk to you about not just GitHub Copilot, but we're going to talk about generative AIs uh, as well. So we're going to start with kind of an AI orientation, because what we have found is that it, it, with everyone on the same page talking from the same terminology, it makes it easier to kind of demystify what all of this is. And then we'll get into how GitHub is dealing with AI and our Copilot product that is not only, you know, uh, very popular in industry, but we use it ourselves. It's something that we use for our developers to uh, save time, produce better work. And then in the back third of the presentation, we'll get into the discussion around managing risk, figuring out how is, as a procurement officer, as an in-house attorney, someone who's interested in this technology, how do you assess what kind of risk that uh, is your company going to have if you end up adopting? Now, I would not be an attorney if I did not start out with some disclaimers. Uh, this is not intended to be a sales pitch. I'm not trying to sell you on GitHub Copilot. I, I wouldn't even know how to do that because I don't have any ties to our signing up process. This is more of an informational presentation. And the stuff that you're gonna see has not been vetted by the company. These are not official GitHub statements. Uh, some of the stuff that might come up during Q&A uh, could potentially get me fired because I have opinions that don't always mesh with what is supposed to be the official company line. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. This is not official GitHub policy. I am also a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. I am not giving you any legal advice. Please rely on your own independent judgment, in-house counsel, those types of things. Uh, this is a shallow overview on a deep topic. 
And Shane already covered this, but please ask questions because this is something where I, uh, it's easier for me if I have some interaction. So I'll give you a very brief background about myself before we dive in. Uh, I am a former software developer. I used to work for uh, Apple back in the late 90s. I worked for a bunch of startups in the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina. Uh, what I discovered from doing that is that I was not good as a software developer. I kept getting routed to kind of a technical writer role. You know, go comment someone's code, go write the manual, go give a presentation to the leadership team. And what that meant was that even though I got my degree in computer science from North Carolina State University, uh, I decided to go to law school instead. So went to law school, graduated, ran my own law firm for 10 years doing business litigation work and get up at an opening for a guy doing kind of the contract stuff. And so I kind of closed that loop, came full circle. It was only five or six months after I started that GitHub Copilot, uh, first chat GPT went viral. We'll talk about that in a minute, but GitHub Copilot got released and AI kind of became my professional life. So let's dive into that with what I'm calling our AI orientation. As a reminder, this is gonna be a shallow dive into a very deep topic, but I'm trying to get as much information as I can in a short amount of time to make your time, uh, make this useful to you, to show you that I value uh, what you are doing by being here. So let's start. What is artificial intelligence? As Shane hinted, there is no good standard industry-wide definition. One thing you'll often see is they will describe it as a computer system that can perform stuff that required human something in brackets. Initially, some months back, they're saying, oh, it's stuff that required human labor. But like no one says your washing machine is artificial intelligence. Then they would say, okay, well, it's human intelligence, but we don't call calculators AI. And in fact, language models are really bad at math. That's one of the things that make them funny. You know, you'll see on social media, someone asking chat GPT to do a math puzzle and it just completely gives the wrong answer. Uh, and so there's no good real way of saying what AI is. In my view, it's just a marketing term. We have this concept called machine learning that I'm going to talk about more. Machine learning does not sound very uh, attractive from a marketing standpoint. So people just hype it up and call it artificial intelligence instead. One thing to note, though, is a distinction between what we would call a discriminative AI versus a generative AI. So these both use large language models, but a discriminative AI is designed to distinguish things. So you hold it up a picture and it says, oh, OK, this is a robot or that's a dog or a cat, something like that. Generative AI is creating new stuff from scratch. And we'll walk through kind of how that process works. Uh, I do also have some AI generated stuff in here just to show you. I just put in artificial intelligence in Dolly and these are the four results it gave me. I don't know what it is about robots having keys and doors that all four of those, you know, showed up, but that's what that is. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is not new. It is a very well established area of computer science that's been around since before most of us on this call were born. It's about training machines to learn from data without a human having to explicitly teach them how to learn from that data. And it started back in the 40s. Before most of this computer stuff even existed, machine learning was already in the works. And so I'll give you some examples. I don't know if any of you have experience with Chinese typewriters. The Chinese language is very complex. The characters, there are tens of thousands of them. And so in a Chinese typewriter, it used to be called a double pigeon, you'd have roughly 2,000, 2,500 ish little blocks of different characters. And at the time they were kind of laid out in, in what we would consider like an alphabetical fashion. And what happened was that to become a good typist on a Chinese typewriter, you basically had to memorize the position of the keys. It, it was very slow. And so in the 1950s, typists decided, well, if we're going to have certain characters that we use more often in certain contexts, let's reorder the stuff on the typewriter. So Mao Zedong was three different characters. They were in three different spots on the typewriter. They would then be clustered together. Let's just put one, two, three. So you just do a very quick tap and go from there. This type of approach, what they referred to as connected thought, became a precursor for what we would now call today as predictive text. So you can still see kind of the details on this in modern, you know, 2020 type stuff going way back to 1950s typewriters. In 1959, a researcher at IBM coded how you could play Connect Four on a machine. And back then you didn't have much memory, so you couldn't do a wide list of commands. 
And what he came up with was this algorithm called alpha beta pruning. Those of you in industry might recognize it now as the min max algorithm. That's what it became. But essentially it taught the machine to look at a board, look at where the, the different ships are located and based on that, make the optimal move. And so pretty much all cool algorithms today use machine learning to work. Everything on social media is machine learning. The predictive text functionality on your phones, that's machine learning. It's stuff where you're taking a data set and the machine itself, the algorithm, the program is adapting over time based on that data without a programmer having to actually go in and tell it to do that. So I'm going to show you this picture here. I went to NC State University, as I mentioned. This is one of the drawings that Dolly created. The reason why this is relevant, I'm only showing you one of them, is because one of the other ones ended up being a hallucination we will talk about in a bit. Before we get to that, one of our developer friends at Microsoft put together this chart to kind of place all of this into perspective. Artificial intelligence is trying to get computers to do tasks that required a human something. Machine learning is teaching the machine to learn. Deep learning is a subset of ML designed to mimic neural networks. And then within that, you get these large language models that everyone is talking about. So some more terms that matter. Uh, a parameter, you'll see in press around language models, this talk about parameters. JetGBT4 has, I think it's like 1.7 trillion parameters. We'll get to that in a minute as well. Think of that as a coefficient in the model that gets changed by the training process. And we'll walk through why that matters in a bit. A token is a unit of stuff. So think of it in the text context as a word, typically. In the art context, it will be a pixel, something like that. The prompt is what you send to the model. The meta prompt is what actually gets to the model. Oftentimes, a, a creator will layer on some additional secret sauce to make it work well. So for example, if you're using GitHub Copilot, you send it a request that you want to let you know initialize a loop give me code on how to initialize a loop the extension will add in additional stuff as context this is a software developer they're coding in java you know those types of things with the goal of getting a better result and so the industry term for those results are completions and the github context we call them suggestions because there's always a human in the loop when you're using our stuff but completion is kind of the standard description hallucinations are what all of the lawyers kind of fret about. So a hallucination is a completion that has false info. And I'll explain why those happen and you can't really avoid them later on. But this picture is a hallucination. So it's the same prompt that I had before where I'm asking it to have a tire for North Carolina State, uh, but this is actually UNC Chapel Hill here. That was one of the four results. So it's possible for these things to hallucinate. They can do very convincing hallucinations. If you didn't know better, you might absolutely think that is NC State attire, uh, but it is not. And so as part of the hallucination uh, minimization, if you will, a mitigation, one of the ways of minimizing that is called retrieval augmented generation, where you basically give it context from an authoritative source in the hopes that that will influence the resulting completion. So we're going to talk a lot about all of this stuff as we get into it. So I'm going to go through a partial timeline. I'm not going to go step by step. There's a few things I want you to, to notice. OpenAI has been around for a while, and they were founded originally as a video game company. So they focused on machine learning, but it was in the context of if you taught a computer to play old Atari games, could you teach it to seek rewards in those games, focus on getting points or high score or something like that? And what would happen if you ran that on a loop? And so that was really their focus. They have a thing that they call Jim Retro. You should check it out. It's, it's interesting from my standpoint as a guy that loves video games, but it really fed a lot of information on the concept of reinforcement learning. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, in 2017, the folks at Google released a paper called Attention is All You Need. And that described transformers. At the time, no one cared. It did not create a big splash. It was just not something that a lot of people cared about. The interesting innovation with that paper is that it described how you could train models in parallel faster. And so it became, instead of just having to wait to do your training ages, you could slowly speed that up by just adding more cards doing the processing and you'd still get a good end result. This paper now is highly influential. Every LLM that's come out has got this at its core. But at the time, it just it didn't really make a splash. 
what happened was that one of the engineers at OpenAI read the paper, said, huh, this is cool, let's try it out. And then over the next few years, you kind of see with the OpenAI releases how that's going. And so from 2018 to 2023, we've got a lot of new stuff out. What I want you to notice is the parameters that are in parentheses. So chat GPT one and two were not terribly useful or popular. They didn't work very well and they're still available. So like you can toy around with some of them if you want. Uh, and so they had, you know, max at 1.5 billion parameters. The first one was 117 million. We're not even into the billions yet. Chat GPT three is when stuff got interesting. At some point between one and a half billion parameters and 175 billion parameters, this pre-existing process that produced not useful stuff suddenly got really useful and very exciting. And so from that, we led to kind of the development around codex, taking the learnings from GPT-3, tailoring it specifically to code. That was the precursor for GitHub Copilot. So in 2021, Codex and Copilot get released that same year. And then hopefully all of you remember taking, chat GP, taking GPT-3, the transformer, slapping a chat interface on it, that's when everything really went viral. So this November to February-ish, 2022 to 2023 time window, everyone just was floored by what AI could do. And it became instantly the most hot topic with politicians, businesses, the whole shebang. Uh, and so what you'll notice in those last two bullets is that there are a tremendous amount of language models that have now been released. Uh, Llama, Llama 2, Code Llama, those are all from Meta. Uh, Palm, Gemma, and Gemini are from Google. Claude 2 is from Anthropic. Mistral 7B is from uh, Mistral. Uh, just this year, it's only mid-March, you've had four fairly large models get released. Sea Lion is the first model focusing specifically on Southeast Asian inputs, because what we'll find later on is that the data is biased towards English, it's biased towards America. Um, just because the nature of the training data bakes that bias in. And so the sea lion is a regional model designed to help mitigate that and give people options, still producing good results, but catered towards Southeast Asia. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about LLM training. I mentioned the bias. Let's talk about how this works. Essentially what they are doing is using text and data mining, this longstanding thing that's been around for a while, to take human readable inputs and convert them to what are essentially glorified high-end spreadsheets. Uh, Simon Willison is a very famous developer. He created the Django web framework. He's very deep in the AI stuff. He describes it as money laundering for copyrighted data. I don't quite agree with him, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, in terms of the process, the process is called ingestion. So this happens offline. It is very time consuming. Essentially, you're taking an enormous amount of data. Uh, this graphic is from Meta's Llama model that they described in the white paper announcing its release. It's five terabytes of data. And basically, you are feeding it into the machine and you're letting the machine sit for months. Like we're not talking training in hours or days or weeks. We're talking months of letting this algorithm just run. And the training process, it's super computationally expensive. Like you need a lot of graphics cards to help run it. And it ends up being in two different parts. The first part is the actual training itself. And so one of the processes for that is a concept called masking, where basically you take any particular sentence, you hide one of the words, delete it, mask it, and then have the algorithm go through every possible word in your dictionary. And based on that, adjust those parameters, those coefficients we talked about, based on whether or not the particular word fits in that particular sentence anywhere within your training data. And so over time, what you get is just these massive files of what are essentially floating point number arrays. And that's, that's really it. So like if you pull some of these open source language models and, and open up the hood, look in them, there's very little code. It's almost entirely floating point numbers, just gigabytes upon gigabytes of floating point numbers. So that training process is step one. And then you get through this reinforcement learning part, the stuff that OpenAI had really pioneered back in 2015 when they started their work, where you're essentially red teaming the model. You're trying to get the model to do something, see what the results are. Based on that, you add in adjustments, you tweak things, you add in guardrails. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to do. Like that requires a lot of human intelligence, a lot of personnel. It's ruinously expensive to do that well. 
And that's part of why you're seeing most of these good, useful models coming from major companies, you know, Meta, Google, the OpenAI, of course, which has a tremendous amount of investor funding, because it's hard to do that well. But this essentially is where you're putting in the guardrails on the model to steer it, to, to give you something useful. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is where Meta has gotten their data. Common crawl is the bulk of it. That's basically just a web crawler going across the web. You'll notice GitHub is in there. We have public repositories that host billions of lines of code. So the reasons why these can do code outputs fairly well is because code is part of their data set. Uh, the books entry, we'll talk a bit about later on because that is one of the, the potential problems with this type of technology. Uh, that books thing includes a chunk in the fine print, and I've, I've mentioned the paper down here if you want to pull it up, uh, where it references a data set called Books 3. And Meta describes this as publicly available books, but if you actually open Books 3 or find it, uh, it's essentially a bunch of pirated ebooks. So it's a lot of very high quality data for usage purposes, but it's all copyrighted. And so that is one of the thorny issues that is going to end up getting resolved in you know all this litigation going on uh, because that's a potential problem and we don't know for sure what goes in most of these large models most of the uh, producers don't tell you the details like i don't know what's in an open AI model i couldn't tell you because they keep that as a trade secret uh, but books three it's it's believed is in all of them because it's a tremendously huge data set of high quality data that's good for llms but just also happens to be copyrighted. So that's a potential problem. Uh, okay, so how they work. They're really just guessing words. I know it, it seems simple and you don't believe me because there's no way something just guessing words can do something like that, uh, but I promise you it's true. So basically you're taking the prompt. Based on the prompt, the machine is guessing the first word it thinks you want. Based on that first word, it's then running in a loop to guess the next word, then the next word, then the next word. Uh, and there's some intentional randomness here. We call this a temperature or a heat variable uh, because if you only pick the most likely word each time, it's possible to get into basically a repetitive loop where what you're getting is not a good output, where it just repeats itself over and over again. And so the randomness is designed to help break that, where maybe you're picking the most statistically likely token, then you'll pick like the third most likely one for the next word and so on. But once you realize this is the structure, it's just guessing one word and then going in a loop to guess each additional word. You can see this is how the hallucinations come in. And this is why you can't really avoid them. They're congenital to the technology. Because as you're guessing each later word, there's no reasoning. The machine doesn't know what the prior words are. It's basically just kind of doing this pattern matching, trying to fill in what comes next. And so these hallucinations will sound utterly convincing because that's its job. It's trying to give you a response that sounds like something you would want, but there's no fact checking. There's no reasoning taking place. It is not intelligence. It's, it's just kind of a machine doing what a machine is trained to do. Uh, so as an example, you have a sentence, I'm a bit jet lagged. It was an eight hour blank. An LLM typically would fill in flight because statistically that is the most likely answer to this particular type of sentence. But you could have a long trip, you could have a long ride, a long journey, a long mission. Uh, and so this is what LLMs are basically doing, iterating one word at a time. Now with this example, when I talked earlier about masking, take this and run it in reverse. This is essentially the masking process. So if it had flight there, you deleted that out and just put a blank in and then went through every single word in your dictionary, calculating the likelihood that that's going to be the answer. That's essentially the model training in a nutshell. And so when I mentioned that these are just floating point numbers, that, that's really all they are. So I mentioned Willison earlier. He's got a tremendous amount of cool stuff on his blog dealing with language models. And I've got some more uh, sources at the end if you want to learn more about it. But one of the cool things he created is a GPT-2 tokenizer where you can take random words and see what numbers they have in the GPT-2 model. Uh, you can put in the numbers and see what words it spits out, all kinds of other cool tools to it. Uh, but this is how the LLMs work. So a capital the, capital T the, is position 464. Uh, lowercase the with a leading space is 262, so likely more common in the particular model. The reason why you're seeing leading spaces here is because kind of your, your count of what we call token count, the amount of data going back and forth between you and the model 
is limited. And so by including the space with each word, you don't have to have a separate token every time there's a space in a sentence. And so these language models don't just have words, they also have parts of words. So that way they can piece stuff together if a given word just is not there. This is why, even though it's biased towards English, you can also use this for other languages that are not English. The results are not as good. The data is not as compact, not as efficient, but it will still work because it's able to piece things together from parts of words as well. Uh, and so what this is doing, it's basically pattern recognition. And so if you think of human geometry, we already are able to do this intuitively as humans. So like you look, for example, with a line, a line has length. You can compare one line to another by comparing their length. You know whether or not they're the same size. Uh, rectangle, same type of deal. Length and width, you can compare how similar two rectangles are by looking at those two dimensions. Take an LLM, it just takes that to an insanely huge level. So OpenAI's API returns a 1,536 dimension token. So when I talk about these floating point arrays, that's essentially what that is. This vector relationship has 1,536 different parameters that you can look at to decide how similar is this thing to this thing. And so what you're doing is you're recognizing a shape. The prompt is a particular thing. The AI is taking that prompt and saying, okay, based on this, this is the shape I'm looking for. Let me take the first part of the shape and then basically fill the shape in based on what I've given it so far. That's all it is. It's, it produces very cool results, but at its core, it's a very simple concept. So how this works, you know, the small models, what we call a small language model, is a good use, but it's limited in scope. So like your smartphone autocomplete functionality, it's essentially a large language model, but you can't really do it for much outside of completing your text messages. What happens is that as you add scale to it, more stuff works. And we don't fully know why, because we're using machine learning. So the human is not involved in that training process. But as you add more parameters up to a certain point, we don't know where yet. As you give it more context up to a certain point, we don't really know where yet. Uh, and you throw more computing power at it. You get a lot of really cool results from these language models. And everything ultimately goes back down to binary. You know, the language models are still only ones and zeros. So the same basic process that we would use for, you know, natural language text or code also works for images and audio and video because it's all ultimately ones and zeros. And so that's how this stuff has managed to advance so quickly across so many different aspects of the industry because it's all basically the same things just on different data sets. So it's very common in AI related presentations to have some kind of AI output to share with people. This prompt on the left is what I fed into chat GPT for explaining that I was giving you a presentation tonight and I asked it for a limerick to include as part of my introduction, which you see in the chat bubble there. Now, if you're an AI skeptic, you might think, well, that limerick's not very good because like, you know, it uses Y's as both the, the first line and the last line. If you want to do a good limerick, you shouldn't really do that. Uh, it describes you all as people as open chains might, which I'm sure you are, but that's kind of a weird description for a bunch of people. So there's, there's stuff to criticize there. But if you're not an AI skeptic, the, the machine just gave me a poem. Like it's not something I could have came up with. And so now we have this limerick, you know, uh, memorialized for perpetuity based on this particular set of data. So in terms of what's gonna happen next, so I've given you kind of a background on where we've been, what the current state of the, uh, the industry is, what you're gonna have in the next months, years for the foreseeable future is the language models are going to be super commoditized. There's gonna be a bazillion different language models covering every conceivable use case. The bigger companies right now are trying to make the models bigger. Like you saw how OpenAI went from 117 million parameters in GPT-1 to now trillions of parameters in GPT-4, and that's just gonna keep scaling up. Because at some point there's gonna be diminishing returns. You're not gonna get as good a result relative to the tremendous amount of computational power you need to get an output, but we don't know where that diminishing return spot is yet. So you're gonna have bigger models in the near-term future. You're also gonna have smaller ones because there's a tremendous interest in running these things on mobile. 
if you can run it on a phone or a tablet or something without having a tremendous bank of, of graphics cards, that creates a lot of potential for use. You know, the entirety of GPT-4's file set can fit on my phone. It's less than a terabyte in size. The issue is the amount of time it takes to process a prompt into a completion. And so there's a lot of effort into smaller models, specialized models, particularly around topics like medicine are being tested out, especially in the open source world. Open source models are huge because everyone's kind of sharing their own work and tweaking and, and you know, forking other people's stuff and seeing if they can improve it. There's gonna be a tremendous amount of development there. And that I already mentioned with C-Line, regional models are gonna be big, trying to mitigate the natural bias towards English, towards the United States by focusing on regional specific training data. Uh, you will have more and better hallucination tools to, to, to minimize the hallucinations. Because as I mentioned, you can't avoid them. It's, it's natural to the technology when you have something that's guessing in a loop one, one word at a time. Uh, and so trying to minimize that, everyone's focused on it because we don't want to have these machines that can do cool stuff, giving you things that are wrong. The politicians in particular don't like that, and the companies don't want to be regulated by the politicians. So there's kind of a mutually reinforcing trying to fix this uh, circle going on. And then the big thing is going to be giving the AIs access to stuff. So extensibility, plugins, allowing, for example, uh, ChatGPT to interact with search engines. So use Google or Bing with it so that you can use retrieval augmented generation just as part of the design flow without having to have the human interact. You know, if you're doing stuff with M365 Copilot and you want to know what you talked about on Teams earlier today, enabling the Copilot to contact the Teams API to get your chat logs and summarize them and pass them back, uh, that type of stuff is going on. I'm sure there's other things I can't even imagine of because we've got so many people uh, working in this space. But extensions and plugins are going to be huge. Mark my words on that one. Uh, so that's the kind of the orientation on AIs, LLMs. Sorry that it took as long as it did with me talking as fast as I was. But that brings all of us to GitHub and how GitHub is doing this stuff. So first, of course, is what is GitHub? So GitHub is a, imagine if a social media company focused on software development. We have a tremendous amount of software developers. I, as a former failed developer, had a GitHub account before I started working here. Uh, we have an Arctic Code Vault where we stored a, a point in time of all of our repositories. I'm in that. My, my code is not good, but my code will apparently survive a, you know, a, a catastrophe because I'm in the vault. Um, and so we are the market leader on what we call continuous integration and continuous development, basically allowing companies to build their software faster. So it used to be the old day, you'd ship a product, you then spend like a year or two in development on the next version, you'd ship that and so on down the line. Now, everyone's trying to ship quickly. You're shipping bug fixes, you're shipping feature improvements. If you've got apps, you're sometimes doing multiple updates in a day, trying to improve the user experience. And having a social platform with tools to enable that uh, makes life easier for the companies and it's more fun for the end users. So that is kind of GitHub's bread and butter. GitHub Copilot, came out back in uh, summer of 2021. So we're, we're coming up on three years. This is something that is now a hot tool that everyone is talking about, but it's actually been around for a while. And it's designed to be a pair programmer, where if you are developing something and you're stuck, or you want a hint, or you just want to have someone there over your shoulder to propose advice, uh, that is what Copilot does. You're off typing in Visual Studio Code, and every now and then it spits results that will either speed you up or give you a new thing to think about. And this is helpful for how developers work in practice, because often what they do is we say they're in the flow. They just want to get their ideas out into the code editor, and they'll worry about the bug fixes and everything else later. And having a pair programmer help you with that. Uh, makes your life easier, faster, and it's, it's, it's really cool stuff. Uh, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to give you a demo in a minute. So this is one of those things where this is enabled by default for everybody. Every developer at GitHub, every developer at Microsoft gets GitHub Copilot by default, even for our special projects like Windows or Office or Bing, uh, and they even give it to the lawyers. So I have access to it, and I'm going to show you. It's not a fancy demo, so don't get your, your hopes up, but I'm going to give you a brief demo. And part of the reason for this 
is that we get benefits from it. It speeds up our development process. But part of it also is we, we build GitHub on GitHub. My entire legal life is in GitHub issues because the view is that by using kind of a dog fooding approach, it puts us in a similar position as our customers. We learn what you like, we learn what you don't because we deal with it firsthand. And with GitHub Copilot in particular, we didn't have to change much in terms of policy to adapt to it. GitHub has zero Copilot specific policies that were implemented before we started deploying this to developers. Microsoft has a few, but it's mostly because Microsoft also works on stuff for governments, classified projects, and those types of things you have to be cautious about. But beyond that, there was not a lot needed. We just turned it on and set people loose, and it has been fantastic. Uh, so what I'm going to do, this is going to be very brief. It's, it's a quick demo. One of the common things with GitHub is that computer science students around the world will upload their homework to GitHub for their teachers to grade. And so as part of the training data, you know, mentioned in Llama that they used GitHub's public repositories for training, that pattern for this particular project is in there. So I'm going to replicate this project. I'm going to show you what that all looks like. Uh, if it crashes and burns, blame the technology instead of me. Kidding, but not really. Uh, let me fire up Visual Studio Code. And then I'm going to share my screen if I can find it. <laughs> Here we go. All right, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new file. So as a reminder, we're, we're in Java. We're trying to do this loop. Every third run in the loop, we're going to print fizz. Every fifth time, we're going to print buzz. Every 15th time, we're going to print fizz buzz. Uh, so in Java, the syntax, we want to do this. And now I'm going to stop typing. This ghost text you see on the screen is Copilot. So to get Copilot suggestions, one of two things happens. You either stop typing or you can do a keyboard shortcut where it will send back the full list of possibilities that is generated. From a data flow perspective, what's happening is that when I stop, there is an extension in my editor called the prompt library that is taking my context. So in this case, it's my public class FizzBuzz line of code in the bracket. And it's adding that to kind of the secret sauce that GitHub adds in. I mentioned as part of the meta prompt, we're adding stuff in. Mushes that together into a prompt, transmits that to what we call the Copilot proxy service. And so what that's doing is two things. One, it's doing kind of an intent classification. So a code classifier in this instance, it knows I'm writing in Java, it knows I'm doing a method. And then we have filters that are created by Microsoft's Office of Responsible AI to help screen out bad stuff. So if I were instead trying to type in, please give me instructions on how to hack the Central Intelligence Agency, we would ignore that. We don't want to respond to those types of requests. Once that pre-processing is done, everything is bundled back up and sent to Microsoft's language models, their Azure OpenAI service. And it's going to spit back up to 10 suggestions in the form of an array. And so in this case, it's given me nine. And it sends that whole array back. And so what you saw on screen as the ghost text was position zero in that array. And then there happens to be several more. So that language model sends the array back to the Copilot proxy service where we're doing more filtering. So we do the code classification again to make sure you're actually getting code back and it's not we don't accidentally give you instructions on how to hack the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, we run those same filters from OpenAI. We also run a filter to scrub out things like email addresses, because as part of a hallucination, it can create a fake email, and we don't want that getting into people's code bases. So that gets scrubbed out. We also look for the most common, what we would call vulnerable coding patterns. So SQL injections, path injections, things like that. And if we see one of those, that gets deleted. So think of the, the suggestions array as an egg carton, the suggestions are the eggs. If any of those filters fail, the egg gets thrown out, deleted from the suggestions coming back. Uh, and then we also have something called a duplicate detection filter that I'm going to talk about in a few slides that basically is screening out stuff that already exists. So I've just decided to accept this particular thing and we're done. We are done with this particular demo. Uh, I told you it wasn't going to be that fancy, but I want to make sure that you saw it so you could see how that works in practice. Let me go back to my presentation here. And now let's get into the legal stuff, because I know that's why all of you are here. So managing risk. Before we manage the risk, 
you have to quantify the benefits to decide if this is worth the trade-off. And so there's a few things to do with that. One, of course, is know your use cases because what you're intending to use any LLM for, GitHub Copilot, you know, in particular, but any language model, you got to decide what you're going to do. Like, is you, are you just going to give it to everybody and hope it works? Or are you going to target it to specific uses? And so in the Copilot context, we tend to see four things that are used most. So one is kind of the pair, pro, pair programmer approach that I had mentioned, where you've got a computer sitting on your shoulder and it's just giving you tips. Uh, code refactoring is super common. You all would be amazed how much code is in like COBOL after all these years, because it's more expensive to transition your code to something modern than it is to just keep maintaining the old stuff. The problem is that the people that know the old stuff get old and retire. And so you have this struggle of finding developers for old languages because it's not taught in schools. And then the ones you hire charge an obscene amount of money as they should because they're specialists. So using LLMs to change your old COBOL code to something like Rust or Java or something like that is very common. Uh, speeding up mundane tasks, so writing unit tests, LLMs are great for that because it looks at what you're already doing, guesses what you want to do, and it just dramatically speeds that up. Uh, and then we have upskilling. So it's, you know, a lot of developers, when we go to, to school for this type of thing, we don't learn all the particulars of every language. We learn computer science concepts. And so if you're in your career as doing Java all the time, but now all of a sudden you have to use JavaScript, even though they both got Java in the name, they're totally different languages with totally different conventions. Having an LLM will help kind of improve that. So once you know what you're going to do, look at the data. Look at your time savings, which is the most common thing that these are being deployed for. But then also look at qualitative stuff, like are your developers enjoying what they're doing? Because if they don't, they're going to quit and you're going to incur a bunch of costs hiring and training their replacements. And then once you've got the data, assign a dollar value to it. That's going to become your baseline to deciding whether or not the risk is worth it. So a common example we do is that say you got a thousand developers at hundred thousand dollars a year. They spend about two thirds of their work week doing code. If you can save 25% of their time to put them on other things, that's functionally a $9 million benefit. Reason why we pick 25% is that we have done a lot of studies on co-pilot use from our customers over the past two years. So, and they're going to kill me because I misspelled the slide. Duolingo had time savings of between 10 and 25%. Uh, Mercado Libre had time savings of above 50%, just a tremendous amount of saving of time. And so if you just hit somewhere in the middle there, the amount of money you're saving is already in the millions of dollars. Now, once you do that, you've measured your potential benefits. Now you can get into the risk assessment. And for those, I've got some basic rules. Rule number one, AI is not intelligence. We call it intelligence, but it is not. There is no reasoning taking place there. This is a tweet from Yan LeCun. He's the head of the uh, AI team at Meta. He says, any four-year-old or elephant is way smarter than an LLM. And he's right. He got completely roasted for this by people who love AI and are hyping up the benefits of AI because like, oh no, this is intelligent. No, it's not. There is no reasoning taking place. It's essentially a parlor trick that does really cool stuff. I'm not minimizing the, the coolness of the parlor trick, but it's still a parlor trick. It's not reasoning. That's why hallucinations exist because there is no reasoning process within the AI. So you have to keep that in mind as you're thinking through how to deploy it. Rule number two, you can't avoid the hallucinations. So you need to use AI in use cases where they can be minimized or don't matter. So what I've got, these are four examples. There are others, but these are four key examples where you've seen language model AI adoption faster because the hallucinations don't matter. Coding is number one. And the reason why it works so great for code is two things. One, you've got a constrained syntax universe. There's only so many different ways to do something. You look at natural language, you can say any given thing thousands of different ways, but there's only one way to initialize a loop in most languages. And so you're working within this constrained universe and there is always a human in the development loop. So if something hallucinates, if you know, I'm trying to run that loop 100 times and it gives me a suggestion to run it 101 times, the human that's there will catch that and change it because they, they're tweaking this to, they're used to doing kind of the software development approach of revising their code to get the functionality they want. Gen AI is very good at summarizing because you're removing data. So the hallucination tends not to matter because what happens if there's a hallucination is that it just means your summarization is, is less good than it could be otherwise. 
you very rarely get something that is a brand new, fresh, completely false fact. It's also very good for brainstorming because if you're trying to do what, you know, kind of ideation, give me 20 ideas for doing whatever. If it gives you something wrong or silly or ridiculous, it doesn't matter because that can be a good thing. That can help trigger kind of your thought process to what you're trying to do. And it's particularly good with audiovisual stuff. And now there's, there's a whole bunch of ethical discussion around this. But the thing with AV and why LLMs work so well is because you're working on the order of pixels. And so if you have a pixel in the wrong place relative to the overall whole, it usually doesn't have much impact. And so you look, for example, at pictures that are obviously created by AI, people with three arms or eight fingers, stuff like that. That's a hallucination. But if you look at that in relation to the whole picture, it's really just kind of a small part of it. So people love it. You also have the same thing with audio. You know, my, me giving this presentation to you today, someone could take my 45 minutes of talking and from that create an audio version of my voice to say almost anything because the, the Gen AIs are just that good with it. And if something is wrong in that audio output, it's small relative to the overall sound. Uh, so make sure that you are aware, you can't avoid the hallucinations. And if someone is trying to sell you a product, is that they're integrating AI into everything, figuring out how they deal with hallucinations and the fact they're going to happen is one of the biggest risk mitigation pieces. So the third piece is what I call a three layer cake framework. This is where you deal with everything else. And so what do I mean by three layer cake? So first, Focus on the base layer of the law. Does the law allow the particular use that you're trying to do? And when I say the law, I particularly mean fair use. So one of the key discussions in this topic is around copyright. Is this a copyright violation? Is this money laundering for copyrighted data, as Simon says? And the short answer is people are going to come up with different arguments for it based on their philosophical beliefs. If you have a copyright in natural language text, your thought is, I own copyright for that text. An AI creator's thought is going to be, I'm not taking your text. I'm looking at the positional relationships, those coefficients that we talked about. That's not your copyrighted work. And so that is an easy thing to talk about in the world of code, because code does not get much IP protection in the first place. Anything that's too short or purely functional, like the quick sort algorithm, Stuff like that cannot be protected. You can't own it, you can't copyright it, you can't license it. And that was the state of the law before generative AIs exist. So code is kind of like the shallow end of the pool. Natural language is somewhere in the middle. When you get into video, audio, pictures, that's where it gets complicated. And that's where I, I stay out of that discussion because there's some serious uh, philosophical things that need to be addressed by legislatures. And if they don't address it, it's gonna get addressed by the courts. But based on your intended use, look at the law and see if it protects you. GitHub has put together a, a multi-page document. Happy to send it to you. I'm going to give you my contact information in a bit that lays out the court cases we think make the law, makes it legal to create LLMs and to use them for purposes of code. But if you're wrong, if we are wrong, if in fact the law does not allow this, you get to the middle layer of the cake, which we call te uh, technical mitigation. So we have a thing called a duplicate detection filter. And what this does, this is on that second pass through to the Copilot proxy service. We are taking that array, everything in that array. We're deleting out the white space. So delete the tabs, delete the spaces, delete the carriage returns, because none of that matters for compiling. And with what's left, we're doing a comparison between what's in the suggestion versus what is in all repositories, all public repositories on GitHub and seeing if there's a match that is over a certain size. So for us, it's 65 lexemes, 65 tokens, 65 things. Uh, on average, that comes out to about 150 characters. So for example, the, the assignment operator, the equal sign is one lexeme. Comparison operator, two equal signs, that's still only one lexeme. A variable name is one lexeme, regardless of how long or short it is. And look, doing that comparison between what's in the suggestion versus our normal search index, if something is 65 lexemes or longer, we delete it if it already exists. So that means whatever you are getting back is going to be one of two types of things. It's either short enough that you can use it because it's too short to get that IP protection in the first place, or it's longer, but it's unique to you at the time. It doesn't exist anywhere yet. It's based on your existing business logic, so no one else is going to have it. 
So that's the second piece. We think the risk is low because of the law, but if we're wrong, that technical mitigation reduces that risk even further. And then if somehow that technical mitigation fails, because you know I work in tech, stuff breaks. If the microservice stops working or there's a bug, somehow something gets into your code that shouldn't have, and that leads to a third party coming to you and saying, hey, you're using my code, I'm, I'm gonna sue you. Then you go and look at your contract and see if there's indemnity protection. GitHub has provided this since day one. We were the very first company, even before Microsoft, who owns us, we have offered this protection from the beginning. If you are using our service, you have that duplicate detection filter turned on, you're using the technical mitigation, and something goes wrong and you get sued, we will defend you. We offer unlimited defense protection, unlimited payment of adverse judgments if those happen, that is baked into the contract from the beginning. We've offered that since December two years ago, when this first became a generally available product. Microsoft joined us in September of last year as part of their co-pilot copyright commitment. And so anything from Microsoft, if you're using any generative AI service, you're using the, the filters, you're not trying to do something silly like jailbreak it and point it to your own endpoints. If you're using it the way it's supposed to be used, you will have protection if something goes wrong and you get sued by a third party for an IP violation. So most common legal topics, the IP risk and risk allocation is number one. That is number one, two, and three, and then there's a big gap of nothing before you get to number two. Everyone wants to talk about IP risk. That three-layer cake is where you should look to kind of assess how to deal with that. Also ask whether or not the company is keeping your prompts to train things. So in the case of GitHub and Microsoft, we don't. If you're an individual user, you can choose to share your stuff with us. If you're a business or enterprise user, you don't even have that option. We don't keep it because, frankly, we don't want that risk. We don't want to have your stuff laying around at rest waiting to be ingested in some month-long process later. We just don't want it. Uh, but that's something to ask because one of the things that has happened is that OpenAI's policy, when ChatGPT first went live, is that they're hoovering up everything. They're keeping all of your stuff. And so people that were using it in kind of a shadow IT fashion, using it without permission to do so, we're basically giving away trade secrets. So that's something to ask about. The security and data flow is important. So from our end, everything is encrypted. When I went through that demo, it was encrypted on my machine before it went out over HTTPS, you know, TLS 1, 2, 1, 3, encrypted end to end. At no point in time is it ever decrypted except when it's physically at the machine, decrypted in RAM, processed, re-encrypted, sent again, and then deleted during garbage collection after it's processed. Our whole data flow is set up to minimize risk of a data leak. And then the next most common topic is who owns the outputs? When you're talking about natural language or audio video, I don't know. I'm not equipped to, to talk to you about that particular thing. What I can tell you with code is that it's unlikely anyone's going to own it because most of what you're getting is not capable of being owned. And so what will happen is that if you want to register the resulting software, you register the whole compilation the AI bits and the human bits. And as part of that, there's a little box on the registration form that just says, I'm disclaiming the parts that were given to us by AI. You don't have to say line by line what that was. That's never been a legal requirement. But you just put that in there and you register the compilation. So for us, as I mentioned, we're in the same position as our customers. When we register a copyright in the next version of Microsoft Windows, we got to disclaim stuff. So for example, you can't can't claim a copyright in code that already exists publicly. If you ship your code before you copyright it, you can't get a copyright. And so in the disclaimer, we would disclaim all code that already exists in a public forum. We would disclaim the bits that are created by AI. And then we would have a copyright on the compilation bits that are left. So these are the most common legal topics and how we have dealt with them. Um, there's a bunch of resources that, that are available and the stuff that I can give you uh, so first, if you want to learn more about GitHub specifically, we have put together a trust center that is designed to be, it just answers so many different questions. We talk about security, we talk about privacy, we talk about labor, is Copilot going to you know, lead to developers getting fired? Uh, we talk about the contracts. If you scroll to the bottom of that page, you will see me and all of my glory giving an explanation on the contract stack. Um, go there. We've also got these separate PDFs that are not attached here, but I'm going to drop them in the chat so that you have them. Uh, and then also I've got links to these two things here. Simon Willison is great. Like he and I have different political views on some things, but he's just awesome, especially in the world of AI. He's got so many cool things on his website, such great informational material. 
Uh, and then Stephen Wolfram, who many of you will recognize, has a very long but accessible deep dive on what these models are doing. And so if it's something where you want extended reading, he has got something great to talk about there. Uh, and I'm going to leave this up for a bit. Get connected with us if you have questions or want more things. So I'm going to answer questions here in a bit, but feel free to connect with Gian and I on LinkedIn. This is my email address. Don't share it, please, because I don't know what kind of ridiculous spam I'm going to get. Uh, but if you have questions or want stuff around what GitHub does, I'm happy to provide it to you. Um, let me drop these PDFs into the chat so I don't forget. And so let me see if I can do this. It looks like I can upload files. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing briefly. Hang on a sec. Zoom is uh, freaking out on me. So I'm going to drop in the generative AI framework PDF that is uploading now. And then let me find a summary document here. And this summary document I'm going to send you is designed for in-house councils. It has a lot of the same stuff I've covered in this discussion. Uh, separately, I'm going to export this into the slide deck out and have it sent to Shane so that he can share it with you all as well. So you'll have all of this information. I'm big on sharing info. Uh, beyond infringement, looking at Jim's question here, compliance obligations about CMI attribution and so on. Okay, so the challenge here is that this type of stuff is not possible. And this is one of the things that no one believes, but we've, we've tried it so much that there's no way to avoid it. So when you're training these language models, you're not doing a copy and paste of the code. There's no code reference table. There's nothing to copy from. And so if you get a given output that already exists, and let's say you want to do an attribution or you want to you know, follow some kind of, of copyleft license, it's not possible. Because if you take the output and walk back to the through the algorithm to the source, there is no source. It's basically just this high-end Excel spreadsheet of floating point numbers with 1,500 dimensions to it. Uh, and so from the standpoint of trying to comply with that, you can't. And that is a point we have tried to convey to the Copyright Office because they're doing kind of listening sessions on how their guidance is going to pan out with this. It's a point we've made to the court in the pending litigation. It's just not how these language models work. And so I don't have a good answer for that beyond just you can't do it. So what we've tried to do, and let me see if I can, if I can do this. I'm going to reshare my uh, code editor. What we have tried to do for customers that want this type of functionality is basically create a modified duplicate detection filter where instead of blocking it out entirely, if there's a match, will give you a sampling of repositories where that match exists and let you kind of go search to see what languages might apply. Uh, and so I'll use FizzBuzz as an example. I've got this functionality turned on by default. Most companies will not have this turned on because you're going to have it set to block. So it just gets deleted before your end users see it. But I'm a special case because I'm a lawyer and I want to see these things when I talk to people. Uh, and so earlier we got this FizzBuzz result. And so what you're seeing here at the bottom of the screen is the log file. And so we've got the results in, uh, I, oh, this says no match found. So this is not going to work. Hang on. Let me see if I can do something that will trigger a match. Uh, let's do quick sort. I guarantee this should generate something because everybody does quick sort pretty much the same way. Okay. This has some sample data, so I don't know if this will work, but we're going to try it. We're going to accept suggestion one. Okay. And so what you see here at the bottom is it's called this process. It's found a match. So this is the code referencing functionality, where normally if you had it set to block, you would never see this output. It would be deleted before you got it. But as part of code referencing, we're instead saying, okay, oh, wait, that's chat, don't want that one. Let's do the log. All right, so what we've got is this particular output that I've accepted has at least these different repositories. And among those repositories, we found five different licenses. Now, if you're really deep into open source compliance, the first thing you're going to notice is that these licenses conflict. So MIT is permissive. GPL is not. Which one came first? You'd have to go and find it. What we have found from testing out this functionality is that figuring out code provenance is almost always impossible for most of the matches. Because what happens is that in terms of how often you get a match, you only get them about 1% of the time. But that 1% is heavily weighted to really two different scenarios. One is a new file type situation where there's not enough context to, to give you anything tailored to what you're doing. 
And the second part is kind of universal implementation stuff. So regular expressions, algorithms like quicksort, where everyone does it really every conceivable kind of way. Um, and as part of that, you know, what we found is that developers do what they've always done. They, they want low friction reuse of others code, but they also want attribution of their code. And what happens is that you've got stuff where someone forked a repository or went to Stack Overflow and did a copy paste, didn't care about the provenance at the time because they're trying to meet a deadline and ship a product. And then you get situations like this where you've got conflicting licenses. And so this functionality is out there. It's, it's generally available for our customers who are interested in that type of thing if it's something that they care about. Um, but it's, it's just going to be a challenge to try and do this type of attribution because what you're essentially trying to attribute is among those tokens, what particular coefficients out of those 1500 help produce this particular output. There's no license or anything else that you can comply with because it just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere within the language model. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It's just exceptionally difficult to, to do, if not impossible, but we're trying to build technology that will enable that for our customers, particularly in open source, because we have a bunch of customers that are going to open source their stuff anyway, and they want to do these attributions. So we want to enable them to do that. Uh, it's just exceptionally hard given how the technology works. Uh, let's see. Next question about the prompt not being used for learning. Does the data model mean it's always done in a different environment without using data from the user? Yes. So what's happening is that OpenAI is creating what we describe internally as foundation models. And so you, that language is starting to kind of percolate out broader in the industry. But essentially think of a foundation model as kind of the, the brand name things. So GPT is a foundation model in all of its different iterations. Llama is a foundation model. And those get shipped essentially as a black box. We don't know what's in it. We can't change it. We can just interact with it via API. And so those get retrained periodically by the vendors through this kind of months long training process that we are not a part of. So that's the, the basics. Now, the cool part with these things, especially in the area of code, is that they're not learning in real time, but they give you the illusion of learning because what's happening is that as you're typing along and this prompt has gone out and it's given me a response back, I now have the quick sort algorithm in my screen. If I keep typing something later on, it's capable to pull this previous stuff that I've already accepted and add that in as context for a future prompt. So as you're using Copilot over time, as long as you're in the same session, now a lot of that functionality kind of goes away when your session restarts, but as long as you're in the same session, it will look like the model is slowly tailoring itself more and more and more to your coding style. But the foundation model itself is not changing. What's happening is that this additional context that you're getting is leading to a more tailored output over time. Um, it's just it's one of the weird artifacts of how this stuff works. It's very nifty. But the foundation models don't change. They're always trained separately. Now, where stuff is getting interesting is this concept of what we would call custom private language models, fine tuning, where you basically take a foundation model as your base. You then marry that with kind of this additional, I talked what I call secret sauce, this layering on top that deals with the meta prompts. But if you were to take your existing code base, some span of time of prompts from your developers and piece together, think of it like a mini LLM layer that can then get merged with the prompt as it's going out. Will that lead to a better suggestion, a better completion on the back end? And what our research has found is that in some instances, yes, now, it's not great for everybody. Usually you need at least a million lines of code and that code has to be diverse across different types. So some methods, some unit tests, so on. Um, but what we found is that for certain types of uses, yes, a, a private customized model will exist. But in that type of scenario, we're not changing the foundation model. We're not even really doing any fancy training. It's just, we're creating kind of this thin layer that sits on top uh, very similar to research augmented generation in terms of how it works, giving the, the language model additional context, um, but it helps produce better results. So going back to your original question, it's always trained separate from the user without using their data. It's just something that basically they're, you know, I, I don't know what OpenAI is putting into it, but essentially they're just going to do the updated comment crawl. You know, they're going to reuse books three, 
they'll probably do a rescrape of public repositories, both at GitHub and other competitors that have stuff available in public. Um, but at least with respect to our offering, we're not using user information for that because it's just not something that we want to do. Now, there is types of user data that get used for other purposes. So we talk about user engagement data as kind of like the telemetry for using the service, making sure that it's working. You know, when did your session start? When did it end? What language are you coding in? A lot of the networking data, you know, is tracked on both ends of the transmission to make sure that the networking happens. And so that gets aggregated and we can look at that for things that might need improvement. So for example, we track latency. How long does it take from when you stop typing to the prompt library crafting the prompt to transmitting it to the proxy to the language model and back down the, the end? What is that total time budget? And so our goal is, and I'm gonna misquote the numbers, it's very tiny, it's like 100 milliseconds. Because if it's longer than that, it kind of, it breaks the developer flow because they're waiting for a response. Um, and so if we see latency creeping up over time across all of the Copilot users, what that tells us is that we need to add more compute power to the system. So everything lives in Microsoft Azure. It's routed among different Azure zones. We've got one in Switzerland, one in France, one in the United States, and one in Japan. And if we see that latency creeping up among a particular geo, maybe we need to add a zone or relocate where a zone is to help minimize that. Um, so that type of data does get aggregated and used for the product, but that's not changing the foundational models. That's changing all of the extra stuff to help make sure that you're having a good user experience. Okay, I am sorry that I talk very fast. I, I know I only had an hour and a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to cover. Any other questions? And let me do this. I'm going to reshare our contact info so that you have it if you want to reach us. Um, I don't know, Shane, if we're able to get the questions on YouTube. I assume there will be comments later that I can go back and kind of oh. ping. Uh, yeah, I think we're currently getting no questions on YouTube, so we're good with just what we have right here. Um, but I do have one sort of ending question. First of all, your presentation, T. Greg, is amazing. <laughs> it's very useful. And uh, one, one thing that came up a lot, and I think it's very important the way you framed it, is the way that you know, these type of LLMs are not intelligent. They're just guessing a word. And some people really take offense at that concept. They're like, no, this is really, and it, yeah, it's really good guessing. It's really, really good at guessing the next word, but it doesn't know what language is per se. It doesn't know what a sentence is per se, a paragraph. It's just really, really good algorithmic control of guessing. Um, and that message seems to be the key to managing these things, to knowing that it's doing its best based on predictive analysis of what comes right now. Um, but a lot of companies haven't internalized that. And I think your presentation is one of the first times that, you know, someone who's deeply seeped in this has said this explicitly. Um, are there resources, do you think, that we can we, we can point people at in, in addition to this presentation to help, let's say, you know, someone in an OSPO is facing a discussion with management and management thinks that um, super robots are going to cure all the problems. They can fire engineering or, or similar. Yeah, so the short answer is I do not, but GitHub has an OSPO team. Uh, they might have some stuff. So really kind of the, and, and this is an uphill battle, this is not going to work, but like ArcSiv has a bunch of these research papers where the fact that this is just, you know, very cool, but highly advanced guessing, they make that clear. Like that's in the white papers that are announcing these new models. Um, but you're competing against marketing hype. In marketing hype, you're more inclined to buy something that's cool and new and fancy. And so everyone leans into the hype and, and basically over promising and under delivering without looking under the hood at what this is actually doing. Uh, so what I will do on my end is Gian and I will talk with uh, our team. If any of you know Mike Linksveyer, he is the head of our policy folks. He is fantastic. He is a developer very deep in the open source community. Um, but we'll talk with him and his team and see if there's anything they suggest. And I'll bundle that in with this particular slide deck if you want to send it out. Oh, yeah. No, that would be amazing. And incidentally, Mike used to be one of the board members in open chain um oh. before yeah i didn't know that fantastic he is great long time back. he's amazing he's just a, a titan of sensible cam approaches um yeah he was a board member um after microsoft and uh github built such a strong business relationship microsoft uh slid into the board seat 
Got it. And uh, Mike has always been on standby. He's been great. And just for people on the the call or watching live, you know, a really good practical indication from the open chain side of generative AI being awesome inside constraints is that doing case studies is such a pain. You start with a blank sheet of paper and you're like, okay, let's start typing. And on a community call, that's a real difficult lift. But with um, we use ChatGPT 3.5 to do some test case studies and giving it relatively long, but not huge prompts. It came out with mediocre but serviceable starts to case studies on our ISA standards. And that's phenomenal. That saves us an awful lot of heavy lift from blank page. Conversely, expecting it to be super smart, one of our German communities started asking questions like, tell me about open source licenses from China. And ChatGPT came back with you know, a, a list of four different types of license organizations that made them and rationale. Um, and it, it made up three of those. It had no idea what it was doing. And, and that's an example of you know, using a constrained question with some details like, an ISO standard is being used by a, this size company for this type of thing, blah, 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 write me a case study. It can do a, it can do a case study. It knows what that is. Give it a broad question, like tell me about open source licenses in China. And it kind of is like, okay, open source, China, license. And it just starts grabbing stuff. Uh, the predictive analysis can't work. And I thought that was a really good example of how, you know, if you have a measured approach to this, if you set your expectations that it can take uh, good guesses in, in in constrained areas and come out with great output, that works fine. If you expect it to be some kind of super smart robot, that does not work fine. Yeah, keep, keep your expectations narrow and you can do amazing things with it. Right. And, it, you know, it's, it's said to be transformative for what we do this year because uh, there's an awful lot of heavy lifting where you're shoveling repetitive information that you don't want to do. And that's exactly what these things are good at doing. Exactly right. All right, T. Greg, that's amazing. Thank you so much for the presentation. You were fantastic in setting this up and your delivery is phenomenal. I want you back. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is the first time I've done this to this type of audience. And I, I will be candid. I did not sleep well last night because I was terrified that it was not going to go well. And I'm glad it turned out great. I appreciate the uh, the introduction, having us, and the questions from the audience. Thank all of you immensely. Well, Shane, we're I just, be... oh yeah, I just, go ahead. I, I just I just want to say one. First of all, I want to thank you and everybody here for listening in. I know that there's a lot of information here. Um, Greg is 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 a gem, and he's filled with so much knowledge. We've like Greg had you know and shared. We've we've had this product out for a while, and in that year or so, we've had hundreds of conversations with customers, with lawyers, with believers, doubters, you name it. So that's why we've accumulated all of this information and knowledge, and we're happy to share it. And that's why we're all about sharing and just getting people more comfortable with AI in general. So just really want to say thank you for this opportunity, and I hope this helps someone. Um, and if you have any questions, contact Greg. <laughs> yes, and if I can't answer it, I'm going to redirect it. <laughs> thank you, There's everybody. Teamwork in action. <laughs> no, thank you. It's been wonderful. And for your reference, this recording will be the main access point. The community will be waking up in places like Europe, looking at this recording, and they'll probably swing back with some questions to you. They might join our AI mailing list. Anything that comes up on these topics. I'll flag for you so you know it's cooking. And if you want, you can step in. Uh, yeah, thank you again. I hope you sleep well tonight, T. Greg. <laughs> I think you should. You knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, and this is genuinely the first time I think that most of our group will have had direct from the source chatting about this topic. So deeply appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you all for having me. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care now.